Welcome back to the class. Uh, uh, this is the final uh, session on this section on uh, religion and uh, globalization. So we, um, in the previous session, we uh, were discussing about some of the interesting arguments about uh, religion and globalization, and uh, whether starting, um, you know, stating that the uh, drastic transformations of the contemporary society, as elaborated by Giddens and Bowman and uh, Beck have necessitated that people look for something as a point of anchorage, as a point of belonging, or whether it is the argument about uh, religion being a source of consumerist satisfaction, uh, religion becoming a source of uh, identity, all these things are is what we, are what we discussed in the previous uh, class. So in this session, <coughs> we are continuing that same discussion, bringing in uh, you know this concept of ontological security and uh, existential anxiety something uh, in the similar line, but uh, here we are depending more on Anthony Giddens uh, uh, in order to make sense of that. So ontological security refers to a person's fundamental sense of safety in the world and includes a basic trust of other people. Obtaining such a trust becomes necessary in order for a person to maintain a sense of psychological well-being and avoid existential anxiety. So ontological security, the, a kind of sense of security sense of uh, you know uh, of, of safety uh, about one's own existence and that is derived through a trust of other people and uh, obtaining such trust becomes necessary in order for a person to maintain a sense of psychological well-being um, you know that we have seen uh, people with paranoia uh, paranoia are a kind of a baseless fear of uh, you know anything that 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 can happen people are paranoid about uh, various aspects. And if you look at uh, in, a, in a more societal level, uh, there is increasing uh, anxiety uh, about people, about their life, about a perennial sense of insecurity, a perennial sense of rootlessness, a perennial sense of uh, you know unpredictability of the world. And I hope you will uh, make, uh, it will become more easier when you compare it with the other extreme uh, example, say of a, of a traditional society or a tribal society where of course there could be a sense of insecurity and unpredictability say about uh, weather or about the crops, about uh, some, some natural calamities. But they never experience the kind of unpredictability and uh, insecurity the way a modern man uh, or a modern woman leading a kind of an isolated life really uh, expl uh, kind of experiences. So for Giddens then self-identity consists of the development of a consistent feeling of biographical continuity where the individual is able to sustain a narrative about the self and answer questions about doing, acting and being. Okay. What are you doing? Something. Why are you doing certain thing? On what basis are you doing certain things? These have become extremely problematic uh, questions that are confronting our, uh, you know, our, our society now. Take the case of say for example, ethics. To what extent are we able to uh, uh, to, to, to do things ethically in our, 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 our society. Whether you are talking about uh, ethics to fellow human beings or if you are talking about uh, certain ethical principles towards uh, the world, to the environment, we are all, you know, uh, we, we find ourselves in a very, very difficult situation. Even, even when you want to lead a very ethically sound life, eth ethically, ethically fine life, things are simply beyond us even if you want to consume ethically. You know, you can't avoid a host of things which are premised or which are built on unethical uh, grounds. Uh, if, you, if you turn to become a vegetarian in order to have a more ethical life, you know that uh, it, it's not again a simple solution because the kind of food that you eat, uh, uh, even if it's uh, you know, all vegetarian food, uh, none of these things could be completely produced in a very ethical manner or what exactly is, is, is ethically produced food. Uh, how do we ensure that nobody is exploited in that, in, in that process? How do we ensure that um, uh, it has not really led to a host of uh, other negative consequences to the environment? How do, we, how do we ensure that? So starting with that uh, to the kind of very specific selections that we want to make in terms of our sexuality, in terms of our political uh, predispositions, in terms of our life decisions, uh, you know, chances, employment, you are, you, are, you are bombarded with kind of options and, 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 and contradictory uh, positions. So that uh, uh, to sustain a narrative about the self and answer questions about doing, acting and being. 
the fact that many people find themselves both structurally marginalized and ontologically insecure offer gives rise to politics of resistance and the growth of local identities and uh, this is what uh, we uh, you know are quite uh, often uh, referred to as uh, you know um, resistance identities or uh, counter uh, civil societies or a, or a, a host of other groups because such identities uh, once you uh, the people find themselves both structurally marginalized and ontologically insecure often gives rise to politics of resistance and the growth of local identity so uh, many times uh, you know the the kind of uh, connection that uh, people uh, attach with uh, especially with violent forms of uh, of of resistance are people who find themselves as as, as the kind of a marginal uh, groups uh, for example if you look at the number of um, you know uh, people who joined who fled european countries and joined the isis many of them uh, are, or vast majority of them come from poor background poor educational and financial background so so th this point what we discussed right now is something that uh, you know is must be seen as a part of the larger discussion that we had in the previous class now let me uh, come to the final section of the class where we discussed um, this new religious movements and uh, or it it's they are not excluded transnational religious movements so what are these new religious movements new religious movements are characterized by a number of shared traits these religions are by definition new new in the sense uh, again there is no uh, you know uh, specific date which we can say as as a thing but usually from say from 1960s and 1970s onwards the new they offer innovative religious responses uh, to the condition of the modern world despite the fact that most new nrms represent themselves as rooted in ancient traditions maybe i can give you examples maybe uh, you must have heard a host of new uh, religious movements like uh, say uh, iskon movement hare krishna movement or uh, the movement uh, the the religious cult established by mata amrdandamai or um, uh, something uh, again uh, the sai baba uh, the, the the not the shridhi sai baba uh, the uh, sai baba in in in, in puttaparthi and a, a host of uh, you know uh, protestant groups as well as uh, and and catholic groups a, a host of uh, sufi related uh, uh, kind of islamic groups they are all examples of such kind of uh, things so nrms also usually regarded as counter cultural that is they are perceived by others and by themselves to be alternative to the mainstream religions of western society especially christianity in the normative forms um, very very important uh, argument because all of them present uh, as uh, you know examples of counter uh, cultural one they they of course they might uh, be part of uh, you might be able to say that okay, it's a hindu movement or a or a christian movement but they would have fought with the established uh, religious leaders and es established religious traditions they 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 want to present something as as different these movements are often highly eclectic pluralistic and syncretic syncretistic they freely combine doctrines and uh, practices from diverse sources within their belief system yeah that's another very interesting thing they are never puritan in 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 that sense not quite often but many times they uh, very freely combine elements from different religious traditions and uh, and and a host of other things there are you can you can uh, find out n number of uh, examples from your own locality we have had n number of cases uh, in india in in other places the new movement is usually founded by a charismatic and sometimes highly authoritarian leader who is thought to have extraordinary powers or insights uh, it, it revolves around a charismatic uh, figure charismatic leader uh, baba rahim uh, Ra ram singh could be uh, another uh, example so uh, uh, so 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 these uh, these leaders are considered to be quite uh, powerful quite uh, you know uh, quite quite uh, charismatic and uh, their followers believe that these people have certain kind of uh, extraordinary powers as such so thomas robins uh, uh, says that uh, some acute and distinctively modern dislocation which is said to be producing some modes of alienation anomy and deprivation to which america and europeans are responding by searching for a new structure of meaning and community something very similar to that but here the point is um, they are bringing in the element of ontological security and the questions of existential anxiety uh, using another term but uh, the idea is more or less same 
So it could uh, include changes in values, uh, very, very different set of values becoming more competitive, cutthroat uh, competition becomes the norm of the day, then changes in social structure, you know, families uh, become, uh, undergo significant changes, uh, the, the crumbling of family uh, as a system, women uh, started going to work and increasing levels of, uh, you know, divorce. So, 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 so single parent uh, families, so uh, same sex kind of family. So, so we are witnessing a very, very radical change and changes in the role and character of religious institution, secularization. So all these processes have very significant impact on the way in which we perceive ourselves, the kind of sense of ontological security that we have and to the extent of uh, how anxious we are about our own existence. Um, so the rise of uh, uh, new religious movements to a more uh, diffuse spectrum of cognitive and affective disorientation stemming from the deinstitutionalization of many aspects of modern private life, hand in hand with the more alienating patterns of mass institutionalization of modern public life. The same, same, same point that we discussed, the kind of uh, deinstitutionalization of many aspects of modern private life, our families, our say marriage systems, our, our religious things have become kind of a deinstitutionalized and uh, more alienating patterns of mass institutionalization of modern public life or uh, public life becomes more active and it becomes more institutionalized. So, so this countervailing processes bring in quite a lot of tension. In the face of this social dissonance, the proliferating NRMs provide a more holistic sense of the self, a sense of self that transcends the constellation of limited instrumental roles recognized by modern mass society and anchored in a greater sense of moral community and purpose. You, if you ever have a, had a, uh, you know, opportunity to meet with volunteers of these uh, new religious movements, whether it is ISKCON or Hare Krishna movement or uh, any of these movements, active volunteers, if you talk to them, you will realize that they are deeply, uh, they have deep convictions in which they are, they are, they are preaching. So they, they might have uh, been, been volunteering in that, they must have maybe, uh, you know, handed over all their wealth to those people, but they have some deep faith in certain higher, higher uh, values, certain higher ideals, and they are, they, 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 they would have been uh, deeply disappointed with their uh, life in the, the so-called, uh, you know, normal society. And, and uh, you know that if you uh, meet many of these volunteers, many of them would be highly uh, educated people, professionals uh, who must, must have left their high paying jobs to become a volunteer in many of these, uh, uh, you know, ashrams and then uh, institutions. So uh, they would present themselves as the people who have given up everything for certain higher uh, goals and certain certain higher uh, ideals. So they identify themselves as a part of a larger, uh, you know, uh, moral, virtue, uh, you know, virtuous moral community because they think that that is what is lacking elsewhere. They would uh, tell you a number of cases about the outside world being filled with, uh, you know, uh, selfish people of cutthroat competition, of, you know, reckless consumerism, hedonism. So they would present themselves as staying away from all those negative, uh, 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 you know, oh, wiles of society, the ills of society, and then trying to create a kind of a moral uh, system. So uh, and anchored in a greater sense of moral community and purpose. So uh, now, what are the kind of impact of secularization of on on these things? Peter Berger, another very important uh, sociologist, uh, would argue that the religious m monopolies of these past are gone, and unlike uh, to ever return under the conditions of advanced capitalism. In Burgess' view, this means that the religious tradition, which previously could be authoritatively imposed, now has to be marketed. It must be sold to a clientele that is no longer constrained to buy. Uh, this is exactly what you know we are we are we were talking about. Uh, on the see the, the the point about secularization is quite conflicting. Okay, on the one side, uh, I myself said that uh, secularization as a thesis uh, failed. But if you look at the other uh, scenario, a lot of other studies, for example, there are very interesting studies which say that uh, in, in many societies, especially in Western Europe, in Nordic societies, in Finland, Sweden, Norway, uh, the number of people who declare themselves as irreligious or non-religious is above, well, uh, say 40 percentage. Or there has been statistically proven, statistics show that uh, by some say uh, a, a host of studies that the number of people who 
consider religion as insignificant is always on the rise, especially in developed societies. Especially in developed societies, you will find their number increasing in India, you will find their number increasing in Japan, in the US, in, in, in Europe, especially more in the uh, Nordic region. So, uh, there is a very strong argument that there is a connection between economic well-being with that of uh, religion. That uh, people in these societies, they are, you know, Nordic societies have the lowest crime rate. They, they are the most peaceful uh, societies, at least for, for their own uh, people, a more kind of homogeneous uh, societies. So, there they have identified alternative modes of alternative forms of ethicality and morality. So, their morality is not based on religion, but there is a morality. It is not that, uh, you know, religious people live without any sense of morality. So, their morality may be uh, uh, based on some, some deeper respect to fellow human beings a deeper respect to certain human values. So, that can uh, bind a society together, that can make a society far uh, peaceful and uh, less aggressive and, and more, more kind of a peaceful uh, society. So, secularization, uh, Peter Berger argues that it is a historical fact that the religious institutions have lost much of its power that it earlier had. Of course, now you talk about, uh, you know, religion and politics coming together and then, but, but they are not concerned more with religion, but they are more concerned with politics. You, you take the, the case of, uh, you know, uh, every such kind of formations, they are, they are taking religion for political purposes. It is not the other way around. It is not that they want to, uh, you know, uh, assume political power so that to, to for the greatest, uh, uh, you know, uh, for the greater uh, service of their religion. It is it's, it's not, it does not happen that way. So, religion, uh, the institutionalized role of religion has gone down. Uh, we no longer will have to have a scenario where you know religious heads will dictate on on everything but uh, it but it it must be now which uh, religion has to be sold to a clientele that is no longer constrained to buy that you can either choose to buy you can uh, choose not to buy as well so religion in the modern world operates as a component part of the globalizing process in fact even when religious involvements are perceived by participants to be acts of resistance Within the dialectical framework of a global system, uh, system, the resistance serves, ironically, uh, to call further attention to the process of globalization, thereby advancing the crystallization of consciousness that is pivotal to the process of globalization. This, in turn, presumably will prompt even further religious developments. So, uh, when you, when, when you, uh, when you are involved in a in a in a religious uh, you know movement as a as a uh, you know form as as a fight against uh, this disrupting elements of uh, globalization it's actually uh, you know happening as a dialectical process because you are you identify something as a as as global as something uh, the other as something against and then you create your own sense as opposed to that so this dialectical process really shapes both both the the, the global as well as the the local we have had discussions about that so even how you consider your own religious self in opposition to that of this global other uh, has is, is is always a product of this dialectical process the religious in the transnational movements bring to mind the particular power of religious iconography and symbolism that is used to mobilize persons in diverse countries and continents as also uh, to the fact that their normative agendas are grounded in sacred rather than secular vision. These large uh, you know, transnational movements or new religious movements, their uh, iconography and symbolism are, are very uh, interesting uh, to mobilize persons from diverse countries and co continents as also the fact that their normative agendas are grounded in sacred rather than the secular vision. Now, another sociologist Mandeville points out uh, to the following features of transnational uh, religious movements. Now, you know, new religious movements can either be confined to a particular uh, region or they can become transnational. And uh, uh, maybe in the contemporary time, there could be very hardly any such kind of cults or any uh, such kind of movements which are not transnational. So, uh, this connection you need to make it very uh, clear this transnational and new religious movements. Um, in India, you know that there are uh, quite a lot of foreigners are attracted to many of these, whether it is this uh, very um, 
uh, very very curious case of Swami Nityananda. I am sure that all of you are familiar with him, uh, who is supposed to have now established his own kingdom somewhere uh, else. So he has uh, had uh, you know hundreds of foreigners as his uh, uh, his his followers. Or Amrudananda Mai has uh, thousands of foreigners uh, across the globe. She has uh, you know her own ashrams. Or uh, Osho had uh, you know Rajneesh had. Uh, things and then um, then um, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, this art of living, though uh, you may not be able to call it as a you know as a, as a uh, typical uh, religious thing, but it, it's it's it, it's something very close to that. So uh, all of them can be both uh, local as well as transnational in its character. So they occupy a peculiar political space, but not necessarily a specified uh, place. They have become transnational. Um, for example, uh, Amradandamai has his her, her headquarters in Kerala, whereas uh, um, Ravi Shankar has his headquarters in, in, in Bangalore. But they, uh, they, they occupy a much larger political space. That many of these movements operate across borders and without exclusive reference to a specific nation, state or region. Further, that a certain variant of these movements are often engaged in activities which are explicitly critical of state regimes or traditional aspects of state sovereignty and uh, uh, none of these examples that I mentioned are, are of that character, we know that, uh, they never question the state authority, they always try to work within the state uh, uh, parameters but there are a number of other uh, examples, uh, this Ram Rahim who is currently in jail uh, in, in, in the part of Punjab is an example who uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, maybe we can say that he, he challenged the state sovereignty to a large uh, uh, extent. So, there are similar n number of examples where uh, while some of them try to be confined with the larger logic of state, some others try to move beyond that. So, globalization aids the work of this transnational religious movements even as they themselves constitute the phenomenon that we describe as globalization. Intermediaries including professionals such as lawyers and management consultants, specialists in media and cultural production have become involved in the heritage creations, uh, uh, heritage creations the world over. So, uh, how modern they are, we, we have been discussing how modern they are, how, uh, you know, uh, how efficiently they make use of this modern um, technologies and modern systems because all these transnational movements are, are quite professionally run. You know they have the best of the accounting system, best of the advertisement, best of the you know public uh, pub relations uh, mechanism. So so they 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 are on the top of every every, every technological uh, advancements. So TRMs leave local context considerably altered, and have very serious implications for cultural diversity. They work with and through local communities and individuals, empower and even capture tribal caste and other local associations. They create boundaries within communities that are often divided into supporters and antagonists, collaborators and opponents. The observe, the obverse side of this is that they also have to do with the unmasking, unmaking of other boundaries as they work across borders of locality, region and nation. Very, very important uh, uh, arguments how they uh, they have to really create a uh, space for themselves, an identity for themselves and how do they create that uh, identity. Uh, many times you know that uh, people can be distinguished on the basis of the attire that they wear, the kind of a uniform that uh, wear or the kind of specific uh, hair uh, style that they uh, want to uh, put on. So, all these things really provide uh, a sense of boundary, a sense of boundedness uh, to these people and uh, and that comes with uh, consequences. That comes with uh, you know many times conflicts with others. But that's how they 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 survive. And uh, the TRMs and uh, state power. Many times religion is used only as instrumentally as a pool of symbols to be drawn upon, but also as an object that is to be molded and reformatted, keeping in mind political ends. TRMs constitute sources of violence, particularly when they are able to conjoin with the state power. Um, you, you, you can uh, take a number of examples, whether it is in Sinhala nationalism or uh, you know, Islamic movements or, or Hindu movements or, or, or Christian movements where this connection between the power and politics becomes very, very, very intermingled. 
and uh, here uh, I, as I mentioned in the beginning of the first lecture in the series, uh, this essay is taken by this um, uh, sociologist uh, Shail Mayara and her work uh, which appeared in EPW where she uh, analyzes uh, Vishu Hindu Parishad and uh, Tablighi Jamaat as examples of transnational uh, movements in India. And both started in India, both uh, you know uh, expanded uh, to the global uh, scenario in a big way. Now, uh, bo bo the uh, Tablighi Jamaat is the largest Muslim organization uh, in the world. They, they have the largest Muslim congregation that they have uh, every year in Nizamuddin in, in Delhi. And VHP was uh, you know founded in India and it represents as a platform of all, all, all Hindus uh, across the globe and uh, especially we, the branches of VHP is, is very, very active and powerful in uh, Western uh, countries in, 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 the, in the US and in many of the European societies. So how they influence uh, the home country, how many times they shape the politics of the home country, how they uh, cling on to certain ideas and identities of uh, India in the US. Uh, so they are very, very fascinating uh, sets of readings. So anybody wants to uh, to read more closely, I, I thought it's uh, not required to go into the details of these because they are case studies. But if anyone of you is interested in, in exploring more, you are always uh, welcome to read uh, these things. So let us uh, stop uh, this class. I hope you would have got some uh, general uh, idea about uh, some some glimpse of literature on on uh, you know globalization and um, uh, religion. I didn't want to give uh, too much of a theoretically loaded. Uh, uh, you know sessions, um, uh, but just give you some brief overview about some of the important arguments about uh, religion and um, globalization. So hope it was uh, useful. So uh, let's wind up the class now, and we'll meet you for the next class. Thank you.